Welcome to the third Quinn Online and Urban Real Estate Research uh, Unit um, webinar. Uh, we have been running these webinars now for a couple of uh, weeks um, with really the intention of looking at some of the critical trends uh, in the South African property market. We, we invariably have been focusing on the COVID-19 impact uh, on the sector. But I think we've also been very conscious to take a, a broader perspective uh, on the market to keep a focus on some of the trends impacting uh, on the commercial property market. We've even been looking at the residential. We've been looking at how we handle space. What, what we really want to do in this webinar is put a specific focus on an issue that has become very central to the market, namely the valuation of our properties. Um, there's been discussions in boardrooms as to whether properties should be valued at the moment, whether they should, property value should be left of where they were a year ago. Um, institutions such as the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors have had their views on the risks of valuing at the moment. So that, I think that's what we want to unpack uh, in the 30 minutes that we have in front of us. With us on this webinar, uh, we have Irvin Roder, well known uh, in the property uh, market, as I always know, with little need for introduction, but I'll be asking Irvin to introduce yourself in a moment uh, for those who, who are sitting somewhere in the world where they haven't heard of you, <laughs> just to make sure. Um, and uh, we're with us as well, a uh, long-term colleague uh, of mine, Rob McGaffin, um, where we've been working together on the Urban Real Estate Research Unit at, at UCT. And, uh, and uh, handling these webinars with uh, Quinn online. Evan, maybe first a few words from you before we get started with the content. Yeah, well, um, my little firm is 32 years old. We do uh, research on the property market. Um, uh, I always call it uh, quasi-academic uh, research because you've got to sell the stuff and if you do it academically, nobody's going to buy the stuff. Um, so, um, and uh, in the process, we survey the property market every quarter and we produce three publications. They are now only available in e-format because uh, of the slow post office and because of the cost of printing, although I must say the cost of printing has come down dramatically over the past 20 years. Um, and we are yeah, one of the larger valuation firms, property valuation firms. Uh, we've been winning uh, first prize as property valuers for about four or five years now uh, from PMR.Africa. Um, and we, then we, very generally, we do uh, some, con some, uh, a lot of consultancy work, uh, and uh, and consultancy work can, uh, as, as you know, it covers a very wide spectrum yeah, yeah. of possible uh, things, which is very challenging. And uh, and then uh, yes, we we've got a one-man department of uh, town planning, so it's quite an integrated little firm. Thank you, Ed. Rob. Just a few words from you before we get started. Morning, Franco. Morning, Owen. Uh, thank you very much. Rob McGaffin from the Urban Real Estate Research Unit. Um, yes, as Franco said, just assisting him with three uh, seminars and webinars um, and, and trying to get a better insight into the property world during the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, um, gentlemen, uh, let's, let's then start the discussion here. I mean, uh, much is being said about the property market, much is being said about COVID-19, but I think there's a bit of a risk that we have this sort of short-term view on the property market. Um, Evan, what are some of the trends that you are seeing uh, at the moment? Uh, in, let's take particularly the commercial property market. Well, let's start from the start. The property market cycle is very long. Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I'm excluding the shopping center market for the moment because their the cycle is completely different. But uh, industrial and office uh, space, uh, their cycle is 15 to 20 years long. And I think the, the current cycle will be longer than 20 years. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, another important point to consider is that the economy is in a structural decline. Uh, South Africans are becoming poorer, uh, expressed as a GDP per capita. Uh, and looking into the future, uh, as far as you can do that, uh, I'm very pessimistic. Uh, I think this down, down trend is going to last for a long time. But one of the surest reasons for that, and we, why there's no doubt in my mind about it, is the horrific um, <clears throat> fiscal problems that uh, South Africa is facing now. I'll never forget, uh, shortly after the news of South Africa's dawn, um, a committee of, of parliament uh, speaking to, or economists were speaking to them um, in an interview, and they made the point that when, uh, when debt as a percentage of GDP uh, goes over 60%, you are in, an, in, uh, in, a, in a debt trap. And now uh, South Africa is heading for a uh, hundred percent uh, uh, percentage of uh, GDP uh, uh, debt to GDP. I mean, it's something I'd like to get back to a bit later because, of course, what that means for the long bond rate and what we've been seeing those movements in the long bond rate, of course, impacts on our discount rates and capital. But maybe let's park that. But uh, yeah, just just on the track. Okay. So uh, this is important because as a valuer. The problem with our values, if I may put it that way, is that they've been trained to look backwards. They're all historians. So they look for uh, actual sales that took place in the past. And you will be amazed how far some of them go back when they uh, do evaluation. <laughs> Quite a number of years. Um, and of course, uh, one would try to avoid forecasting uh, uh, almost always. Uh, but we've now reached the stage where the almost always uh, doesn't apply. Um, there's no doubt about it that we are um, at a tipping point, uh, this country and maybe even the world, um, but certainly South Africa, because our problems are even bigger than the rest of the world, given our debt situation and a few other structural problems that we're facing. One of those being uh, the few number of taxpayers in this country compared to the total numbers of people who need to be fed. So uh, <clears throat> with this as a background, as a valuer, uh, I was on a, in a similar discussion with one of the biggest uh, real estate investment trusts uh, a few uh, weeks ago, where this very thing was, was discussed. Now, the year end is, was the middle of this year, or is the middle of this year of this specific fund. And the question then is, how are you going to value our portfolio? Um, and um, this very problem arose. And my argument is that um, we, we do have a, a, a pretty good model to forecast um, a capitalization rates. And I can tell you that the uh, long bond yield, the 10, year, uh, uh, the 10 year bond yield is not the only determinant of, uh, of capitalization rates and no, therefore sure. of the discount rate. No. So uh, I think the economists use the term, it is, uh, it is sticky. Uh, capitalization rates are sticky. They, they don't, when the bond rate, the long bond rate goes up by one percentage point, it doesn't mean that cap rates go up by one percentage point, thank goodness. And that's one of the beauties of property, of course. It is, you know, it is a stabilization factor in most portfolios because of this very reason. So even though the outlook for cash flow for uh, most property funds is terrible, um, I don't expect cap rates to, uh, to rise by, say, more than half a percentage point over the next year or, uh, or two. So, just to get back on, on this, I mean, yes, uh, but do you see volatility? I mean, are we going to be valuing now and in a year's time we revalue this property and it's going to look quite different? Well, that's, that's a very good point, uh, but that's the beauty of property, of course, it's not volatile. So, as a valuer, you must bear that in mind. Um, Looking into the future, as I'm saying, this is the, the, the instance where one must also look into the future when you consider not only your cash flow, but also your, um, your capitalization or discount rate. Mm -hmm. um, I would, 
I would be, one must be careful not to overdo it. So that in the year's time, you've got to change your cap rate uh, again mm -hmm. uh, downwards, you know. So uh, I would say a conservative and uh, defendable, uh, as a generalization, defendable uh, uh, act would be to, to increase on general a portfolio's cap rate by not more than half a percentage point. Um, in certain instances where you know that the shopping center, for instance, where Edgar's makes a big uh, proportion of uh, uh, of the total income stream, you uh, you may consider maybe a slightly higher capitalization rate, uh, but uh, uh, my preference is to take a view on the cash flow and to say, okay, the void left by Edgar's, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you you, you, you you simply quantify that and deduct it from your from your uh, uh, Previously uh, calculated uh, uh, value. Yeah, yeah. Rob, sorry, did you, want, did you want to add something? I saw you. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to just to follow on that, on that with Aaron. Aaron, what's your thinking behind that, though? Because surely, if your cap rate is meant to be a reflection of the risk of that future cash flow, if it reflects the risk associated with that future cash flow, and all things being equal, leases are going to become shorter and shorter. Um, I think they were already right. uh, prior to COVID. Uh, I suspect going forward, they're going to become shorter after COVID. Surely then cap rates should be increasing more than, than, than you're suggesting? Well, it, it's a fair argument. Um, I, would, I would rather err on the conservative side because it's very embarrassing if you now have to drop your cap rates in a year's time, you know. And, <laughs> As for the length of the leases, you know, this is a long-term trend. I mean, when I entered the property market in the late 70s, you know, your typical leasebacks were 20 years, even longer. Um, yeah. And now a leaseback is defined, well, that's how Ruda report defines it, as, as a 10-year uh, lease mm -hmm. with a single tenant. Um, and not only in South Africa, I know in the UK for a fact, you know, I mean, they, they had super long leases. Uh, I think they had something like 30 years and so on. And they are also coming down. So it's because the whole world is becoming more and more uncertain. Uh, the thing is that the cap rates haven't, because of that, been showing any structural uh, uh, change. And, and the important point, because the reason why it, it, it didn't go up by uh, a factor of X is that um, it's not just uh, long bond yields uh, that drive mm -hmm. capitalization rates. It's no. also the expected cash flow growth. It's very well, important yeah. to consider. I mean, right. the same as for the earnings yield of shares, you know, right. I always yeah, compare yeah. the two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but Irvin, I think you're making two important points here. And I remember, for those of, you, of us who've been long enough in this market, uh, at, after the global financial crisis, valuers were sort of accused why they hadn't seen it. Well, the valuers not expected to be smarter than the market. Exactly, with. exactly. Yeah. So what we are, uh, that's, you're supposed like, to reflect the market. You're not supposed to, yeah. no one, if everyone else feels it's uncertain, well, why shouldn't the valuer have a similar view? Why should yeah. the valuer be smarter than the market? So in a case like, a, so in a case like the present, we, we don't have hard evidence, right? We're all guessing. So I'm guessing that the market is guessing. Yes, um, that's the point <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's a reasonable, it's the only attitude you, want, you, you can have, not so. I mean, if you have to value a property as it, as at today, uh, this is the only information you have, uh, your guess of what the market is guessing. <laughs> yeah. The, the other point that you made, which is always, it's, it's that stickiness uh, of, of data, which has always interested me. I remember also years ago, there were these rules in the South African property market. 12% escalation on net rentals, 15% yeah. on top costs, five-year lease, and an IRR of 21%. And if you didn't yeah. understand that, you were told to go home and when you understood the property market to come back, because yeah. that's the way the market yeah. operated. In uh, fact, this, the same applied at the time to house prices. You know, the, the rule of thumb was that the house prices would increase at 10% per annum, you know, uh, and uh, well, when, <laughs> The poor guy who didn't believe that or was uh, obstinate enough not to believe it, I mean, he had big trouble selling houses. So uh, estate agents were selling it uh, as investments on that basis. Uh, and of course, the world has changed since then. Our, for starters, our interest rate is much lower. Evan, I suppose what I'm, what I'm also 
sometimes wondering is if we just take COVID-19 out of the scenario, would yeah. we have been revaluing properties in any case at this point? That's a very good point. Um, you know, very, I think very... that in the downward phase that we were entering in any case, we, we would have been maybe looking at our properties very differently than a year ago. No, that's a very valid question um, to make. I, I keep on uh, um, <clears throat> expressing the, uh, or making the point that uh, we mustn't forget that uh, in February, before COVID had reached us, um, we were in our second technical recession as a country. No. And it's not just a normal recession. That's an important point to make. This is a structural recession, that's a word I like to call it, a uh, term I would like to use. Um, I mean, you can see looking at GDP, how we've become poorer yeah. uh, uh, per capita, uh, GDP per capita over the uh, number of years. And there's a, the reasons behind it is not purely because of poor management of the government at, at that, uh, over the past five years. It's m much deeper than that. I mean, thank goodness the uh, whites are not uh, managing this country at the moment. Uh, it's, you, um, it would have been catastrophic because it would have been a racial thing then. Um, mm. but, but I mean, we've got, we've got demographics against us, uh, you know, and there is no, I mean, unless you are a Chinese communist, you know, as they had a policy of one, one kid per, per couple, um, we can't have a thing like that, no. which in any event would only benefit us in 20, 30 years from now. No, look, look, I think you're raising an important point, and I suppose this is whether we will walk out of this uh, down, downturn with structural changes. That even if the economy starts bouncing back up, whether this economy will, you know, whether companies will be back, what companies will be back, and in what form. Uh, Kevin, you know, a thing that I've been also questioning, in this environment, is there an argument to either value along DCF versus cap rate? I mean, okay. I mean, now you start saying, well, a, a DCF gives us a bit of a longer term cash flow, you know, I mean, you're at least five years, I guess. I remember when we used to do DCFs of 20 years when exit values didn't matter. We're, we're, we're now down to, mm. I don't know how, what your DCFs five years. like, five, five years. years. Yeah. Five years. Which means that exit value is, can be 50% of the value uh, uh, that you come yeah. out with. Uh, yeah. um, is there an argument for methodology uh, one way or the other? I just love that, that question. Uh, you must be highly intelligent for Dutchman. It's not bad, eh? But <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe it's the French blood in your uh, veins. <laughs> uh, thank you. Maybe it's my mother's side. Uh, yeah, yeah. You see, if I took my French side, I would start from a philosophical position. And then get to practicalities. <laughs> my my Dutch and takes me more. Let's let's be practical, and we may get to the philo philosophical yeah. opinions. But Gentlemen, anyway. can 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 we get back to discount rates and cap rates, please? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Methodologies. Methodologies. Okay. Yes. Very important point. I've actually run the exercise comparing uh, so-called discounted cash flow, which is not pure discounted cash flow, the point you've, you've already made. It's discounted cash flow for five years and thereafter capitalization into perpetuity. Um, and I've, I've done the exercise in Excel uh, comparing the two methodologies. And as long as you, and, and uh, my, my point of departure was that in theory, they should give you the same answers uh, uh, provided you are internally consistent in your assumptions and in, in your yeah. variables. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yes, this little exercise I did uh, in Excel uh, showed that. It's very important to make that the two speak the same language. In fact, I was, um, <clears throat> I was uh, uh, critiquing evaluation of a very well-known valuer recently uh, for uh, a firm of auditors. And uh, it, it struck me look, looking at the way he's valuing it, uh, properties uh, for this REIT. Um, uh, it's easy to, to make, and you should actually make the two uh, give you the same answer, uh, the, the two approaches, uh, because otherwise you're not internally consistent. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm still one of those who believe that uh, it's a lot of extra and unnecessary trouble yeah. to uh, go to a DCF. Um, but uh, as long as you understand what that normalized first year income is. 
And that's where people sometimes get it. They yeah. take next year's income away, and it's not that. It's a normalized... Exactly, exactly, exactly. But at, uh, also, I must uh, uh, stress, um, uh, what we do as valuers when we use the, uh, the straight capitalization method is we then also use what the British call the, the top slice method. Oh, no, okay. uh, we call it the opportunity cash flow because that's a more... Yeah to me yeah. uh, appealing name. Uh, in other words, what the opportunity cash flow represents is that cash flow that you are over the market at the date of valuation or under the market for that matter. You discount, yeah. Exactly, yeah. you discount that and you add or, de or uh, subtract it from your previously calculated uh, capital value. But yeah, also, I think also with leases yeah. becoming shorter and shorter, your, your difference between your DCF and your cap rate method I mean, it, it, you may as well just go along the lines with the cap rate method in any way, with your lease well, becoming shorter and shorter. But you have to be careful that normalized income, you see, that's the thing. You, 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 sure. you act, actually, with a cap rate, you do take a longer term view, you know. Uh, um, you know the, 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 I suppose the issue I always say to students, your first year's income on a property is negative. What's the value of this property? And they go, well, there's a negative number. I'm capitalizing a negative. I said, no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Because yeah. what you're actually doing, you're, 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 yes, the first year could be negative, but even on a cap rate, you're normalizing this with, with a market cap rate, a market, you know. Otherwise, yes, the first year's income is negative. You've got a negative value. Can I make an important point here is, uh, I don't know what other people do, but what we do as valuers when we do the direct capitalization is we don't capitalize it on the, ex on the budgeted first year's income. We capitalize it on the normalized, in other words, market yeah. Yeah. income, market-related income the year one. That's the important, crucial point. Yes, and uh, there are many valuers who don't understand that, I suspect. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we're running out of time, believe it or not. This is becoming almost a, f a Cape Town fireside discussion. <laughs> uh, very pleasant. Um, but, but, but we do need to wrap up. Urban, what can you expect from a valuer's report at the moment? Do you, can you expect a report which has got a long paragraph at the end saying we're doing this with high levels of uncertainty, we're not more any sure than you are, um, big riders of uncertainty. Well, what can you expect? Well, what you, should, what you should expect is that there should be a paragraph or two, three, four, five explaining where we are in where the economy is mm -hmm. and therefore what the level of uncertainty is. Um, this is. And by the way, from an economist's point of view, there's a difference between uncertainty and risk. Right. Risk you can measure and you can actually uh, yeah. uh, take out an insurance policy on risk. But on uncertainty, you can't. Um, so uh, you must be honest as a value and say, look, guys, this is my best estimate for, uh, for the various reasons. And you try to motivate your best estimate. But then uh, beware that um, <laughs> uh, we are living in uncertain times and, uh, uh, and it could be even uh, lower or higher, whatever the case may be. In fact, you could even theoretically, I've been trying my, uh, that my staff should actually use it and do it, but they don't. Um, you should actually put a, a standard deviation to your, uh, yeah. try to calculate the standard deviation or some sort of a minimum and maximum. Um, and well, there's always a discussion about that, that you expect the valuer to take a call. Well, that's the problem. That's exactly uh, the problem. Otherwise, you like, ask the valuer to give you a standard deviation, two standard deviations out. And... Yeah, because the accountants, I mean, they, they need a, a fixed uh, value, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, um, but from an investment point of view, if the valuation is for, for purposes of investment, then there's no doubt about it. You should give your, your, um, your client uh, an idea of the, of the uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's still so a misunderstanding of investment value and market value. Huh? Uh, it, 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 it always amazes me. Huh? Yes, the, people don't understand the difference. The term yeah. I use is um, um, uh, market value versus mm. fundamental value. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fundamental value you use for investment purposes. If you're sitting on, if you are, are uh, an analyst for a big fund, uh, mm. then uh, I would give the, the board of directors both a fundamental value and a market value. Uh, yeah. I always quote the, the, the example, what happened. I mean, 
This is especially important when, um, when the economy uh, goes to a lower or higher gear. Um, you, yes, those of you who are old enough will remember uh, the gold boom we had, which ended end of 1980, 81, thereabouts. Um, and at that time, I had to do a, f a forecast for, of, of rentals for uh, Old Mitchell, for whom I was working then as an, as an analyst. And um, uh, the forecast was very uh, bullish, but it, it, it did show a 17-year cycle. I was sort of sucking my thumb based on, because in those days, the inflation was quite constant. It was about 15%, 14, 15%. Mm -hmm. So you could actually do with a pretty high degree of certainty, you, you, you could do long-term forecast in those days. That, those days are gone. Um, and um, on the basis of my cash flow for, of my market rental forecast of offices in Joburg CBD, um, we bought properties at that stage, which were at the price that were higher than the market value. <laughs> and it was still a good buy, except that uh, it was messed up by the guys signed a, a lease contract, which wasn't very uh, clever. So, uh, so you will have times when market value are, uh, are below your fundamental value and vice versa, depending on where you are in the cycle. And that's why it's so crucial uh, to, to, to differentiate between market value and fundamental value. I'm just interested, but Owen, you've just mentioned a couple of them now, um, and obviously they have an impact um, in terms of what we do. Your your views on interest rates and inflation going forward then, if you're looking at, at forecasting? The one thing I, I refuse to forecast is interest rates. It's just bloody impossible. Um, I'm afraid, you know, there are so many factors working on, uh, I mean, international factors, you know, the Fed decides to do something and there you go, you know, and you look stupid afterwards. I mean, all, all economists, if you go back on the forecast of interest rates going back a zillion years, you'll find it looks stupid. Um, and it's not because they are stupid, but because it's impossible. Because the, the politics plays such a big role in, in, in interest rates. Uh, what was the other one you were asking me to forecast? Inflation. <laughs> Inflation, yeah. Well, I take the simple view that... Um, the Reserve Bank will retain its independence. And more and more, uh, I start having my doubts about it because when, when things go south in, a, in an economy, like it seems is going to happen to us, then you get this Bob option, of course, you know, and you start printing money. And uh, it's a question of time in, uh, under such a scenario that the government will attack the independence, nationalize the Reserve Bank, and then of course the Reserve Bank becomes just a tool of government fiscal policy. So uh, in that case, of course, we could even have hyperinflation, you know. So under those circumstances, who can forecast interest rates? Never mind. Um, um, yeah, so. Um, Urban, I, I think that your point, and I think when, when we started this discussion, is, is so right that uh, there is. I think in this country, little space for fiscal policy at the moment. I mean, you know, to go and spend more, it'll be probably be borrowing even more from the IMF. I don't think there's much space uh, there. I think monetary policy, yes, maybe we still got, we're different from Europe and the United States, where they're hitting the zero, <laughs> where uh, we still have some space. Uh, and uh, Rob, I'm less concerned with the inflation rate at the moment. I think that. You, uh, oh, yes, to come back to that question, yes. So, what we do is as uh, valuers when we are asked to forecast, because sometimes I always, when I'm asked to do a forecast, my starting point is always my expected inflation rate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because everything is relative to inflation, more or less. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, I tend to have it either four and a half or five percent long-term inflation rate. That, that's my assumption at present, and uh, please don't, don't hold to me, uh, hold me to it in twenty years' time. Fine. I think we're going to wrap up. Thank you very much, really. But what I'm taking away from this discussion is yes, there's uncertainty in the market, and I think that word uncertainty is an important word. And Irvin, as you rightly said, we can. Uh, risk is playing cards. You know, you, you know what your odds are of getting a certain hand. Uh, uncertainty, you, you don't know. Uh, uh, how many of us would have seen COVID-19 coming our way? That was uncertainty. 
uh, and that's that's where the problem lies. I think what's also coming through this discussion is very much don't expect your value to be smarter than the market. I suppose in, when 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 we teach valuation at university, we say that the valuer must see the market, must reflect the market, but not be smarter. I think, uh, uh, and I think that uh, uh, we had a, a, a useful discussion around that. I think we've also really made the explored the fact that we are in a cyclical downturn. The property market was already moving downwards uh, pre-COVID-19. And I think that's what we know. I think when we're going to valuations now, it's not a complete COVID-19 effect. Uh, I think those longer term trends have been with us. Um, that's what I'm taking out of the, any other points of summary, Irvin, Rob, that you wish, wish to add and then I'd, I'd like to make a comment, but also maybe just ask it to Erwin as well as a, as to close out. When if we if if leases are becoming shorter, etc., um, and we we can't do these valuations as much as we used to on in terms of longer term leases, notwithstanding that lease lengths have been coming down for some time now, does that mean that? those existing nodes in a city are going to become more attractive because there's more predictability or, or greater degree of predictability around future rental rates in those nodes? Are we going to see a, an increased concentration of investment into particular nodes in a city on the back of that? Well, my theory is that when you, maybe it's not just a theory, it's maybe not mine either, um, is that when you go... <sighs> We go into a phase of greater uncertainty. It's always the fringes that do worse. Uh, Whether the fringes are smaller cities like, say, um, East London or uh, um, Nelspruit, uh, Mbombella, whatever its new name is, uh, or whether it's uh, the fringes in a uh, in metropole in the metropolitan area. Um, I know that's a very broad brush. Um, in fact, you can argue that, uh, as somebody was arguing the other day uh, on the internet, um, uh, who's going to enter a lift going up to the 21st floor um, while uh, COVID-19 is rife? Mm -hmm. uh, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and you can argue that should we not get this under control and nobody knows, that's the important point, once again, an, an uncertainty. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, what's going to happen to the morphology, if that's the right word, of, yeah. our, uh, of our cities, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah, there are so many unknowns now. Okay, interesting. Evan, Rob, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I certainly enjoyed the discussion. I think we unpacked uh, quite a number of points which uh, our viewers and listeners will be interested in. Um, and look forward to a further discussion in the future, maybe the post-COVID-19 analysis and see uh, what happens after this. Um, th thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you all at the next uh, Quinn Online and Urban Real Estate Research Unit webinar.